It is a real joy to be with my family who are here together with me from around California. I'm very excited to be with them and to be with our church family from here and other churches. Very thankful for what God is doing and moving throughout his church around the world to bring revival, to bring reformation, to bring the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm looking forward to the last days. They're going to be awful. They're going to be wonderful. God has a huge, huge, beautiful plan. As we served him overseas, my wife and I, we saw the years fly by. We went two different times, once to Cambodia, fresh out of college. I grew up here in Northern California in Ukiah, had no thought of being in the mission field, wanted to work as God got a hold of my heart in San Francisco, among the homeless, among the, the people on the streets. But God had a plan to send us onto the other side of the world, to Cambodia, and later then to Thailand with the Buddhist Study Center with the General Conference. As we reached out to the poorest of the poor in those areas, and then to those who'd never had a chance to know Jesus, our hearts grew to love the Christ of the cross and his deep love for the lost more and more. And in a real sense, we didn't want to come back to America. But our children were getting older, and our parents were getting older, and time went by, and we felt it was time to return. But to what? We spoke Cambodian. We spoke Thai. Why should we return here? The mission field was over there. But God had some things to show us. And at a youth convention in Houston, Texas, as we went door to door, we heard many young people talking about what they had experienced. And one of them said, I ran into a lady who said, Vietnamese, no English. And I didn't know what to do. Another young person said, well, I ran into a lady who had a hijab. She was Muslim, and she said, no, Muslim, no thank you. And I didn't know what to say. And it began to dawn in our minds that God had brought the world next door, that refugees, immigrants, international students had come to the United States, tourists, business travelers. They were here all around us, and they were from many of those countries, those people groups that we were waiting on for Jesus to return. So we began to pray, Lord, what do you want us to do? We considered pastoring, we considered teaching, trying to figure out what to do, and God put it on our heart to begin a ministry with ASAP Ministries of helping people to reach out to those who are different from them, who speak another language, who have a different religion, a different culture. And that began with about a year's time right here in California so we could be close to family and our daughter could begin college. As we did that, actually right before we left Thailand, a young girl who we had befriended, who had babysat our, sat our children, came up to us. Her name was Supin, and she was from the little Mian tribe up in the mountains of Thailand. One of those places that Adventist Frontier Missions had sent two couples, the Dills and, and Brian and Dewey Wilson. They had learned the language. They had spent years studying so that they could reach people who had never been reached. And some of the Mian tribe came to Christ, including, as the first family, Supin. So Supin said to us, as we were about to leave Thailand, I'm going to miss you guys, but at least you'll be over there where my older sister is. You see, she got married to someone from America, a Mian from America, and she went to live there with him. I'd, and we said, okay, well, what's her address? We'll go see her if we can. Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure where she lives. But when you see her, please tell her hi for me. <laughs> her hill tribe mentality there could not quite picture the vastness of the United States of America. We laughed like you did until my daughter's boyfriend came to visit, and my daughter said, I really want to take him to Thai food. Let's go down the hill and find a restaurant. We hadn't been to anywhere in America. We knew it wouldn't taste quite as good as back over there in Thailand, but we looked it up, and sure enough, there was one in Auburn. So we drove down the hill to go to the Thai restaurant. As we walked in the door, someone looked up and said, Ajahn Scott, Teacher Scott? And I looked at her and I said, what, what? I mean, there was a, a thin, thin waitress there looking at us, and she said, P. Supin, Supin's my sister. 
And we just threw our arms around her and hugged her tight. I encourage you to pray for her because she needed Jesus. She needed to return to the God who had sent missionaries clear over there and now was sending somebody across her path again to invite her to return to church. We were able to get to know her, her husband, who was not a Christian, and her two young children. I invite you to, one more time, ask God to be with people like her. Father, we lift up to you, May, my, May, who is here yet in the Sacramento area, who continues to battle with this new jungle, this concrete jungle, where it's so difficult to live and to survive, but difficult in a different way. Continue to call her heart towards you and reach the Mian tribe scattered so many people here in the Sacramento area, along with the many others that we speak about today. Come, give us your love for them that is so determined, so interested that you will work miracles like that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. How important is this to Jesus? The story we just heard a moment ago in Mark chapter 11 helps us to know clearly that this matters deeply to him. In Mark chapter 11, we just heard the words about one of Jesus' most strange acts as he walks into the temple courtyard. He sees a marketplace. It's not just a a little marketplace. It's not just like where you buy vegetables. This is a place more like a cattle yard where they are auctioning animals. No, maybe they're not auctioning animals, giving you a choice of how much to pay because they've already marked how much these sheep, these goats, these cows will cost. And it is a highly marked up price. First, you have to bring, as a foreigner coming from some other place, perhaps Jews who've been been scattered into other countries are coming back on pilgrimage. But not just Jews, there are others passing through, Romans, Greeks, because Jerusalem is a central thoroughfare. And they are there, perhaps curious, perhaps also to make a little profit on what's going on. The money must be changed because only the temple coin is pure enough to buy the sheep. And those sheep, they must be pure enough So most likely the one you carried all your way that you have raised for this very purpose and it's all you have left is probably not quite pure enough. It has become a racket. And as Jesus walks in, he sees that God's people have taken God's temple and turned it into a profit for themselves. Not merely that, but have done it in such a way that the poor don't know what to do. Confused because their lamb is not good enough. Their money is not good enough. And they are out of funds to do something different. This is the context within which Jesus walks in and begins to turn over tables. Though he strikes no one, we are told that that whip in his hand looked like a sword. We are told that this loving Jesus who would put his hand on lepers and welcome them close, who would welcome um, tax collectors, prostitutes to sit down and eat with him, now looks like a judge on his throne. And the people are terrified. The words ring out, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus was disturbed to the point of action. Surely he had seen it before. Surely he had understood what had happened to the temple. But now by the Spirit of God upon him, he must make a statement, a statement not of anger, though a righteous anger is appropriate, but not a temper tantrum coming out, but the call of God on his heart to show people what must take place in the human temple, what must take place among his people, that whatever is separating them from glorifying God and showing to the world a sacrifice of grace and mercy, a gift of free love must replace this religious system of works and selfishness. And so he moves and acts. And the people run. They run terrified. This is 
the movement of God out of love for who? Well, as we look at the slides, I want to bring you to another picture, another window into the heart of God, into what is happening that is comparable to what we've just read. And then we'll come back to the story. You've perhaps heard of the 1040 window. For the last 20, 30 years, this picture, this way of looking at the world has been shared by missiologists around the world. 1040 means 10 degrees above the equator to 40 degrees above the equator, stretching from Africa, North Africa, across the Middle East, through India, and into Southeast Asia. What is this for? Obviously, it's an imaginary window. It doesn't exist out there, but it is a picture, a, a opening into the most unreached parts of the world. Think Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, and Judaism. These are the places that they reside, the places that have the least amount of people who are followers of Christ. Not only that, this is where the poorest of the poor live. If you want to know who are the unreached, they are the poor. If you want to know who the poor are, they are those who do not know Christ. They are there in India, 1.2 billion unreached people in 2,289 people groups. Yes, if you meet somebody and you ask them, what language do you speak? Oh, I'm from India. I speak Hindi, Gujarati, Punjabi, Tamil, and another one you wouldn't recognize. Like in Myanmar, where we have visited more than India, you go up one side of the mountain and they speak a certain language. They bury the dead one way and they marry in a certain way. But when you hit the top of the hill and start going down the other side, they speak a different language and marry and bury differently. And so they need a unique gospel witness in their heart language. When we are told that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, it is not country nations that is spoken of by Jesus there. The word is ethne, more like our word ethnicity. And it means people groups that need to hear the gospel. As we think of what Hindus face, as they contemplate the cycle of what they believe life is, birth, life, death, birth, life, death. And they take that to assume that a person is reborn, reincarnated according to what they lived previously. Then they look and see suffering as the direct results of what that person previously did. And they know if that is them, that they must pay their dues fully before they can have something better. Into that midst, God is wanting to bring the joy of the merciful forgiver who has borne all of their suffering and made it so they don't need to pay through many lives their karma back, but can receive his forgiveness in a moment and be with God for eternity. And then there's Pakistan, the second largest population of unreached people in the entire world is there in 386 people groups, distinct different and in need of the gospel. Afghanistan with 42 million people, 68 unreached people groups, and 99.9% Muslim. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many precious Buddhist sincere, uh, Muslims sincere in their worship of the living God, of the creator God, trying to understand and comprehend who Jesus is, who the Quran teaches them as a, a born of a virgin, blessed by God, great prophet, someone to be respected, but not fully understanding who he is and why or if he died on the cross. They need to know the love of God, that he is a merciful father and has found the way to secure their eternal salvation through Jesus. What do we do about all these people? These millions of people across the world. How long will it take as I've flown over India and Thailand, different places, I've just cried out, God, what is it going to take to finish the work? Not just another baptism, not just another church planted, but Jesus' return. 
And we know the answer is in Jesus' words in Acts 1, verse 8. It will be through the power of the Holy Spirit. But what does that mean when we pray for it? What is going to happen? What should we be watching for and looking for? In Evangelism, page 570, we are given one of the clear strategies that God has given us for finishing the work. We should be able to see in the multiplying opportunities to reach many foreigners in America a divinely appointed means of rapidly extending the third angel's message into all the nations of earth. Contemplate that with me. Do you want Jesus to come soon? How soon? We want it to be rapid. This is a means by the people he has brought to America and other countries, other cities around the world, like Amsterdam and Sydney, Australia. God in his providence has brought men, she continues, as it were to our very doors and thrust them into our arms that they might hear the truth and be qualified to do a work we could not do in getting the light before men of other tongues. Can you go to Afghanistan today as a missionary? How about Somalia, Sudan? No, but some of them can. If not in person, by their phones, calling their relatives and neighbors, their friends, to share with them the gospel that they have found here. Yes, God has planted them in Sacramento. At least 20 people as we have seen in our prayer time with these cards, which you can also find online at Reach the World Next Door under Get Involved Sacramento. These are the people he has brought to us, and they are very precious. But enough of statistics, enough of millions, even billions. What about that one? That one precious refugee? Because many of them come here not because they wanted to, but because they had to. Like my friend. I'll call him Jakob instead of his real name. Because even still today, it is not always safe for an Afghan or others in America to be known as connected to a Christian. Jakob and his family are one of the most handsome, beautiful Afghani families we have met. We work in Houston with Afghan refugees and other immigrants, helping to call people and train church members to reach out, as we're doing here today. And Jakob and his family happened to walk across the park as we were doing a children's program out there near the Afghan apartments. He saw what we were doing. We walked towards him. We were friendly. And then we invited him to bring his four children to the park to enjoy the time together. How they enjoyed it. They felt welcomed. They felt loved. Not even so much by the children's program, but by a friendly American having a conversation with them. We continued the friendship. And the next Thanksgiving, as my mom came to visit and we were together, they were there, enjoying this unique kind of food, bringing some of their desserts as well. And then they got a phone call on his phone, FaceTime, with his brother back in Afghanistan. Thanksgiving wasn't so happy anymore because his brother was being tortured to try to reveal where Yaqub had hid ammunition that the American government had left behind which he had never done. Of course, he had not been able to do that or done it. But they were torturing his brother because they knew he was in America and most likely had some money or had some knowledge. This went on for two or three weeks until his brother's health was crushed and he was sent to the hospital. It became so much more real to me than it often is even in speaking about it and working among people. For here was my friend with his brother back there in desperate trouble. Praise God, he survived. But they just decided, ah, the brother can go. We'll just take your house instead, Jacob. And now they own and inhabit his home. He's lost everything. Came to America just with a few bags. This man who had almost become a general in the army over there. Many times they struggle. Their marriage struggles. Now it's doing better, praise God, with some ongoing love and support. Their children are flourishing in school. People in America have reached out and embraced them. And when I was last there, I was able to place a Bible in his hands and care and love and pray with him. So we have 108.4 million people around the world. 
That's one out of every 80 people in our world is no longer able to live at home. 43.3 million of those are children. And God says to us in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 to 19, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, brothers and sisters, love the stranger. Amen. This is his call to our hearts. It's not just once in the Old Testament. In fact, after the command to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, it is the most repeated commandment in the Bible. Did you catch that? At least 36 times it tells us to love the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, or just the stranger specifically. Take a picture of that if you want, or just search in a concordance for the word stranger and begin to explore the huge migration in Scripture. So here they are around us, everywhere, like in the temple court, in Jerusalem, as they throng from all over the place. As the scriptures say, they were dwelling there, devout men of every nation under heaven. They are here too. And what is in our way of them? I don't know, maybe there is someone who speaks one of the languages on our cards here, but most likely there's very few, more than 60% of Buddhists, Hindus, Jews, and Muslims in America, in America, do not have a Christian friend. That's a problem for God's people. We have something in our way. Ellen White tells us in Desire of Ages, page 161, that the courts of the temple at Jerusalem, filled with the tumult of unholy traffic, represented all too truly the temple of the heart defiled by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. In cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart, to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly desires, the selfish lusts, the evil habits that corrupt the soul. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Jesus came back then. Jesus has come in the heavenly temple to his most holy place ministry now. And in great controversy, we are told that he came there for the purpose of cleansing our hearts from not only some impurities of what we do and don't do, but from the deeper impurity of selfishness to make us compassionate as Malachi 3, which speaks of this very passage, says, he comes to cleanse us from the sin of neglecting the stranger in our midst. Wow. You mean this last days, this last time since Jesus has begun cleansing the heavenly temple, he's trying to cleanse his church from the things that keep the Gentiles from coming into the court of the Gentiles? Yes. Yes, Jesus was so so passionate about this because he knew in that mess, that loud noise, the Gentiles could not hear. And so he calls us to be his light among the people. There are so many of us who know the Savior already in America. But unlike Guatemala, where we just visited, where one out of a hundred people is a Seventh-day Adventist. Come on up. In the place of Mena, Middle East, North Africa Union, a special place that the church has set aside as its own special union. Because why? Because one out of 900, no, one out of 99,000 people is a Seventh-day Adventist. We have a call to go to those places that have never yet had a chance to hear. And we must ask ourselves, Lord, what's blocking us from being able to reach out to them. Since 96% of the unreached are in that 1040 window, who we've now seen are also the immigrants and refugees who have come to us. But only one out of 10 missionaries ends up in that area. And only one penny of a dollar given to missions, this is the Christian world worldwide, not a specific Seventh-day Adventist statistic, but we're not far behind. 
One penny out of a dollar given to missions actually ends up within the unreached. We must strategically find how we cannot be that den of thieves taught, spoken and predicted in Malachi 3, 1 through 5, and can instead turn our hearts to those who have nothing, like the precious 13,800 who will die today who are under the age of five because they had diarrhea, because they had pneumonia, because there was some birth complication or just hunger. It's like 35 jumbo jets crashing today. We would hear about that. But we won't hear about this other today. We won't even think about it as we have three good feasts today. And so he calls us to come. And he comes and he does this. He says, my church, my people, let me cleanse your heart. I don't want you to run away from my presence. But this is why I must. In Desire of Ages, it continues, when they fled, the poor remained behind. The people pressed into Christ's presence with urgent, pitiful appeals. Master, bless me. His ear heard every cry. With pity exceeding that of a tender mother, he bent over the suffering little ones. All received attention. Everyone was healed of whatever disease he had. The dumb opened their lips in praise. The blind beheld the face of their restorer. The hearts of the sufferers were made glad. Desire of Ages 163. Today he wants to do that again through his people to give them an opportunity to know Jesus. But because they won't walk in here, he must take us out there. I've invited Julie to share for the next next few minutes how specifically practically you can put shoes on the feet of the people next door we have been a part of a ministry to afghani refugees for the last five years in in houston texas and we were doing the children's programs right there at the apartment complex, and we would get like 100. They would just bring them all down. They would see us coming, and they would come down to the courtyard, and we would have a Rise High program for the kids. But then when COVID happened, we, they shut us down, and they said, you can't do this. There's too many kids, and you've got you've to gotta stop. But we knew that we didn't want to stop, and so we took it to the closest park. Uh, the, a place where they could actually walk to. And um, we lost a lot of kids because we had, we had, we made sure that the parents, one of the parents had to come with them. 